just wanted to thank everybody for coming. We're really excited to have this excellent panel assembled today to talk about broadband privacy. Uh, this has obviously been an issue that my boss cares deeply about, uh, and now that we're in this new post-Title II era, uh, he thinks it's really important that we extend uh, strong privacy rules to broadband. So really looking forward to hearing everything that the panel has to say this morning, and Chris, I'll hand it over to you. All right. Good morning. Thank you, Joey. Uh, thank you, Senator Markey, for helping us get the room and uh, leading on this issue for so many years. Uh, my name is Chris Lewis. I'm Vice President for Government Affairs and Public Knowledge, and I'll be moderating uh, for the next hour. Uh, we're excited to be here talking about uh, uh, broadband network privacy. Um, and many of you, I'm sure, followed the reclassification of uh, broadband as a Title II or common carrier service at the FCC in 2015. And, uh, and if you follow that, you probably know that the FCC forbore from uh, uh, the traditional CPNI uh, telecom privacy rules uh, with the expectation, uh, express expectation from the chairman that he would be coming back at some point and looking at uh, making rules for privacy under Title II that actually fit and work for broadband instead of satellite uh, companies with the old telephone rules. Uh, and so we're here to talk about that today and uh, uh, why that's important and what it might look like. We have a great panel. Um, uh, we have three public interest uh, experts and advocates and, and, uh, and one uh, expert from uh, the industry side and I'll just go down and introduce them. They're each going to take a few minutes to, to talk about their own perspective and then we do want folks to uh, engage us in conversation. Uh, so please uh, start to think of questions that you might have and, uh, and when we get to Q&A, just raise your hand and tell us who you are. And I'll call on you and we'll, we'll keep the conversation going. But uh, going down the line here, uh, first we have uh, from my organization, Public Knowledge, we have Harold Feld, uh, immediately to his right, from the Open Technology Institute at New America, Sarah Morris. Then we have from the Center for Democracy and Technology, Eric Stallman. And then finally on the end, we have from the Alarm Industry Communications Committee, uh, it's Mary Sisek. And, uh, we're just going to go down the line here and let folks make some opening remarks. Um, it's noteworthy, and I hope folks saw outside, that um, uh, each of the public interest groups represented here have been writing on this topic over the last couple months. And, and so hopefully you've had a chance to see uh, the studies and white papers that they put out. I believe some of them were available. <laughs> Harold's holding up his <laughs> hot off the press, yet, the press yesterday. Um, <laughs> Uh, but if you haven't if you haven't gotten a copy, uh, you know please grab one on your way out or or check out check them out online. They are available on the organization's websites. Um, so uh, with that, I'm going to let Harold go first, and then we'll just go down the line. So thank you. Um, what I've tried to do here in this white paper, and one of the reasons why it ends up being a lot longer than what most people uh, um, would uh, care to know about. Uh, um, the FCC, the FTC, and privacy is because it's really important to understand the framework in this. There is a tremendous amount of confusion, some of it deliberately sown, uh, about how the structure of the FTC's privacy jurisdiction works and how the structure of other specialized agencies, particularly that of the FCC's, uh, works. And to briefly try to go over the main points and it are the FTC is not explicitly a privacy protector. It is the general consumer protection agency for the United States government. Uh, it is not the sole consumer protection agency. Uh, rather, the FTC sits at the center of a sort of hub and spoke um, where you have associated state uh, uh, consumer protection, uh, but on the federal level, you have a number of specialized agencies, such as the Department of Transportation, uh, the uh, uh, various financial regulators, HHS for uh, uh, health uh, privacy laws under HIPAA, the Food and Drug Administration, and among these is the FCC. 
Uh, I'm happy to explain if anybody wants to quarter me why uh, we do it this way, but just suffice it to say this has been the general scheme. Um, with regard to the FTC and the FCC, this relation goes back over 80 years when the FTC was established in 1914 um, and the FCC was established to be the consumer protector uh, for uh, uh, telephone uh, services uh, in 1934. So this is not something new. And in fact, with regard to explicit privacy jurisdiction, um, the FCC and the FTC have shared um, responsibility for over 30 years, going back to the 1984 Cable Act and the original CPNI rules, CPNI meaning Customer Proprietary Network Information, which the FCC developed under its general rulemaking authority in order to protect competition uh, during and after the bell breakup. So there is a long history here. Congress in um, 19, uh, uh, in the 1990s made some adjustments to both the FCC and the FTC. In the case of the FTC, as part of a shift to a more market-oriented approach, they stuck in a provision called uh, subsection N in the FCC's general um, uh, consumer protection statute, which is section 5 of the uh, Federal Trade Commission Act. Um, which requires the FTC to actually prove a bunch of things, since it works through enforcement, not rulemaking, before it can declare a, um, a practice uh, un unfair or uh, unlawful. So that includes things like, could the consumer reasonably avoid the injury? Um, are there offsetting benefits to competition? But with regard to telecommunication services specifically, the same Congress in 1996 made a different judgment. They said, yeah, we're actually moving into a world where we expect to see convergence. We're moving into a world where we want to see uh, uh, competition between services. Telecommunications networks are very different from the standard marketplace. Uh, both because of the information that the consumer must expose if the communications network is not private and secure from the provider, then all other uh, privacy protections are essentially meaningless. Uh, and this has only become more true as we move these things online. Um, and uh, at the same time, the recognition that competitors must expose information to the telecommunications providers in order to uh, make uh, the system actually work. So there is a specially designed statute, Section 222, which is designed to deal with networks, including the what do you actually have to expose to uh, uh, make it uh, possible for the system to function, uh, what do you have to give to law enforcement, under what conditions. Uh, it's all of the objections that people will have in the rulemaking are pretty much answered already in the statute. So. We put all these things together and we look at additional factors that make this need particularly urgent online. My uh, uh, colleagues over here will uh, speak to that more directly. But we come away with a number of generalized recommendations. One is, of course, the FTC needs more explicit authority to deal with privacy issues. That's not a primary recommendation in here. but. You know, all of the concerns that people raise about operating systems, search engines, social media platforms, and the general way in which um, spyware, for lack of a better generic term, is seeping into our daily lives, um, we all agree that, yes, the FTC needs a, uh, um, you know, a real boost. Um, the most recent real-life example of this is a case called... Um, uh, MD Labs, where a company released the health information of 10 million individuals um, onto the internet and where there's evidence that this is leaking into the information sales market. And the FTC administrative law judge said, yeah, but you haven't proved substantial injury. You, know, you haven't proved all of the things you need to prove under this N, so therefore, no case. Uh, that's wending its way, but it is a rather graphic illustration as compared to when the FCC went after a couple of providers who exposed uh, the information of a couple of hundred uh, um, subscribers and, uh, you know, uh, uh, was quite capable of enforcing uh, its rules. 
Uh, but more importantly, with regard to the FCC, is the FCC needs to do the job it was designed for. Um, this uh, includes looking at how broadband providers are currently collecting information, uh, how the fact that broadband providers are also uh, um, you know, MVPDs or otherwise direct competitors to online providers is influencing um, the nature of their information collection uh, as well as uh, opening up new vistas and opportunities for them to combine information that's not otherwise available. I never give Google my you know, social security number. I have to give my cable provider a social security number so they can do a credit check is just one example. Um, access to the local number portability database is another example so that I can see, yeah, you know, if I'm uh, a cable company, I can see if you're, uh, um, what uh, provider your uh, cell phone is on, so I know when you're streaming uh, video to your cell phone rather than to your uh, uh, laptop, I get uh, uh, all kinds of very interesting uh, information. Um, the, uh, uh, and so uh, we think that the FCC cannot wait um, that uh, efforts to disrupt the long-standing relationship between the FTC and the FCC are um, either are both misguided and in some cases clearly self-serving uh, and uh, uh, in any event no one has shown why the FCC FTC uh, uh, relationship is under attack, whereas, say, the FTC HHS um, or the FTC uh, Consumer Financial Protection uh, uh, Bureau relationship or the relationships with uh, any of the other financial regulators, uh, the relationship with the Food and Drug Administration, none of these is being subject to an attack uh, on the overall relationship and the authority. So if we want to change the way we do privacy and go the way that a number of European countries have and have one privacy enforcer, fine. But then it's one real privacy enforcer. It's not the industry, the cable and telephone industry, lobbying Congress to get rid of what has been a very effective enforcer um, on the grounds that somehow it would be so much better and more efficient and normal um, if we altered um, what has been the you know, standard practice and made this radical reshift um, to exclusive FTC authority without, of course, changing the nature of FTC authority or giving them adequate resources. All right. Thank you, Harold. Uh, Sarah Morris. Thanks, Chris. Good morning, everyone, and thank you to Public Knowledge for putting together such an important event, and thank you guys all for joining us today. Uh, my name is Sarah Morris. I'm Senior Counsel and Director of Open Internet Policy at New America's Open Technology Institute. Um, just by way of a bit of background, New America is a nonpartisan think tank and civic enterprise dedicated to the renewal of American politics, prosperity, and purpose in the digital age. Our experts work on a wide range of issues from national security policy, to work family balance and of course to technology and telecommunications policy. To that end, the Open Technology Institute brings together policy experts, technologists and practitioners to promote ubiquitous, safe and affordable access to communications technologies in communities around, around <coughs> the world and in the United States. So OTI is deeply committed to ensuring that all Americans have access, um, internet access that is both open and secure. The 2015 Open Internet Order had important privacy implications as the FCC took on the critical task of reclassifying the delivery of internet service under Title II of the Communications Act. It both laid the legal framework for sound net neutrality rules and also recognized that broadband is a vital service that should be subject to the foundational principles that have guided communications policy for over a century. Notably, the FCC exercised forbearance from many provisions under Title II. It declined to use its power under Title II to regulate rates or impose tariffs or unbundling requirements on Internet service providers. However, it did recognize the need for authority to, for example, protect people with disabilities, bolster universal service support for broadband service, and protect consumer privacy. As a result, the Commission recognized that the privacy protections that Congress envisioned for common carriers are applicable to the latest generation of Title II providers. The application of Title II provisions in this context is a reflection of the statute's technology neutral framework and the recognition that broadband access is an essential conduit for ubiquitous communications access 
and a platform for the open exchange of speech and ideas. These protections are not only an appropriate extension of the FCC authority, they are necessary in light of a carrier's special relationship with its customers. From its perch as the gateway to the internet, your internet service provider has a unique window into your online behavior. By nature of this role, an ISP can build a comprehensive picture of users' online activities, ranging across time and across different sites, services, and devices. A clear privacy framework developed under the long-standing authority granted to the FCC under Section 222 of the Communications <coughs> Act will benefit consumers, ensuring that the power asymmetry between customers and their internet service providers is mitigated by consumer privacy protections. Um, in a policy paper released last month, I'll, do, I'll pull a herald and <laughs> find it in my pile. So in the policy paper that we released last month, copies of which are available out on the um, on the table, OTI explores the types of information that internet service providers can learn about their subscribers and details the ways in which this information can be abused. Carriers can ascertain the content of all unencrypted internet traffic, and even where traffic is encrypted, carriers know the destination information of that traffic through the domain name, domain name system, or DNS. Under typical circumstances, an ISP can also see each site a user visits, and when, and for how long, revealing user habits and other behavior. This data collection can lead to myriad harms, allowing inferences about things like employment and health conditions, and undermining the internet as an open engine of commerce. To address these harms, OTI urges the FCC to initiate a proceeding to adopt clear rules of the road for protecting consumer privacy online. This proposed framework includes an inclusive definition of consumer customer proprietary network information, or CPNI, an opt-in standard for non-service related uses of CPNI, Transparent access by customers to their CPNI, baseline requirements for data security and breach notification, and a clear process for consumer complaints. As the FCC recognized when it reclassified broadband last year, broadband is no longer just a luxury. It's an essential service, central to the way we communicate in the 21st century. That means we can no longer think of user internet service provider interactions as something that consumers have any real choice about. It's not a choice. If we want to use the internet, and we all do, we have no alternative but to share intimate details of our private lives with a broadband provider. It's only reasonable, then, that we set strong baseline privacy rules to protect that information so that the internet continue to flourish as a central forum for speech, commerce, and innovation in the modern era. All right. Eric. Hi, I'm Maris Long from the Center for Democracy and Technology. We're a, a, a nonprofit a think tank and advocacy organization focusing on, on uh, promoting democratic values and, and civil liberties on the internet and in the digital world. Um, so our, our relatively modest uh, <laughs> <laughs> submission for, 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 today's, um, uh, for today's panel is, is, is a chart that I hope you have uh, in, in front of you. And if not, they're, they're available on, on the back table. And I, and I have copies up here if you need it. Um, but essentially what we have tried to do um, and what we were thinking about at pretty much as soon as the, as the FCC adopted the Open Internet Order is trying to figure out how the, the statutory definition of customer proprietary network information would apply to, to, to packet switch networks because it was not clear that those, that was the nature of, of, of network communication. That, that the uh, that Congress had in mind when they when they uh, inserted that provision in the, the Communications Act, and what to, to answer that question, what we basically did was was break down um, the the basic IP packet, the way that all information is is delivered uh, over the internet um, into its constituent parts, and see uh, how those parts map onto the definition of, of customer proprietary network information, um, which is defined as the uh, information that relates to the quantity, technical configuration, type, destination, location, and use of a telecommunications service subscriber uh, subscribed to by any customer of a telecommunications carrier and that is made available to the carrier by the customer solely by virtue of the carrier-customer relationship. Um, and in that, 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 that final bit, that this, this is information that's made available solely by virtue of the customer-carrier relationship is important because, of course, there, there are other ways to get access to the, this information, but what I think Section 222 is, is uniquely preoccupied with is access to an end use of information that a, that a carrier gets by, by virtue of, of, of their, them being the, the, the network provider for that particular subscriber. 
Um, and, and what we found, uh, and what I submit now, is, is that actually the definition in Section 222 maps on quite nicely um, to the IP packet and to, and to the header information uh, in IP packets. Uh, that information definitely talks about where content is uh, coming from, the, the, the type of content that it is, um, its size, uh, um, things like this. They can really actually tell a, a customer, or sorry, a network operator, or anyone else, a lot of information about what a, a user uh, is doing online without getting access to information in, in the application layer. Uh, and, and that has uh, two potential um, points of significance in, in the current debate. Uh, one being that there's a, an argument right now that, that because traffic can be encrypted, that, that uh, CPNI privacy protections uh, are, are necessary. Uh, in, in CDT's view, this this argument is, is unpersuasive for for two reasons. Um, one, one being is that is that while encryption is, is becoming a, a, an, an increasingly common practice and, and one that we very much encourage becoming a more <laughs> common practice, it, it it right now represents something about forty percent of, of of all traffic on the internet, which means at, at present most traffic on the internet appears to be unencrypted. Uh, so, um, so the argument that, that encryption is, is, is the south for all was first it, uh, assumes a level of, of encryption that we, that we don't think it re reflects the, 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 the current uh, network of our internet environment. Uh, second, e even if all traffic is encrypted, uh, the information that, that is in the IP packet header, that information about the destination source, the, the, the type of traffic, is, is not encrypted, and, and, and for good reason, because if it were all encrypted, the network operators would have no way to figure out where packets are coming to and going from, and and, and that's and that's one important uh, point about CPNI too is 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 ISPs need access to this information because this is information they they need in order to make their networks work, and so there's there's there's, there's nothing that, uh, about CPNI being some special category of information that that network operators shouldn't have access to. What we're what we're talking about here is is simply our, our or what our uh, reasonable uses and reasonable cons uh, consumer expectations uh, about uses of that information, other than the provision of the network service. Um, so, so that, that that information in the IP packet header, e even if encryption is used, is still available to the network operator. And we have seen instances of, of network operators making certain uh, distinctions and, and, and differential treatment of, of, of traffic um, based on information in, in, in the IP packet header. And I think probably the most a uh, current example of this um, is, is, uh, is and, and again, the details of this are, are not entirely clear, but in the context of T-Mobile's Bin John, which, which e even though uh, YouTube traffic was, was supposedly encrypted, that they were still able to determine that this was video traffic and then subject it to uh, limitations of 1.5 megabytes per second, e even though they didn't have access to everything in the application layer of that data. So um, I, in, in closing, I would just simply say that that one, the, the, the CPNI definition in the statute does fit well um, to the broadband context, and, and two, within that context, encryption, while something that we should all be encouraging, is, is, not, is not the, the single answer to the problem of user privacy on the internet. Thank you, Eric. And Mary. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Mary Sasak. I'm counsel for the Alarm Industry Communications Committee. Uh, and just briefly, the Alarm Industry Communications Committee is made up of all of the major associations that represent businesses um, in the security industry, and that includes the companies that come to your home and install an alarm system, or businesses, uh, companies that install alarm systems for businesses, the manufacturers of alarm systems such as Honeywell, um, and all of the large and small uh, companies that sell um, alarm services and systems and also the companies that monitor alarm communications. Uh, this issue of customer information is extremely important to the alarm industry in large part because alarm services and monitoring services all depend on the communications network and therefore the communication service providers, including broadband providers, do have extremely important information about the customers of the alarm industry. 
Um, so, you know, when your alarm goes off at your home, that communication is carried to your alarm monitoring center, and then from there, the communication is carried to possibly a PSAP or a fire fire company or um, fire station or police police officers to respond to whatever your um, alarm situation might be. And uh, so from a business perspective, uh, although we recognize that uh, broadband providers and telephone companies, wireless providers are all in the alarm business, not all of them, but most of them are in the alarm business, um, they do have important information about who the customers are of alarm companies. And they can use that information in an unfair competitive advantage. So the interest of the Alarm Industry Communications Committee is really to make sure that, that there is a fair uh, playing field, that their members um, can continue to operate in a fair manner, and that the communications providers who have information about alarm customers cannot unfairly use that information to then try to grab business and uh, in an unfair and a competitive way. Now, I would also just point out that Congress apparently felt it was an important issue as well. In the 96 Act, uh, uh, Section 275 was put into the 96 Act, which essentially um, gave some protections to the alarm industry um, in relation to local exchange carriers. And one of those important protections had to do with the use of customer information or customer data. Um, but this particular section is really geared toward local exchange carriers. And as we now have a lot of providers in the communications business and, and providing communications networks that are not classified as local exchange carriers, this section does not necessarily translate to also apply to them. So in that sense, it's also a competitive issue among broadband providers that, where this is an example of a, of a restriction that applies to some but not all. And the, um, the hope of the Alarm Industry Communications Committee is that this type of protection would uh, extend to all communications providers, including broadband providers. All right, thank you, Mary. Um, so uh, I want folks to, you know, go ahead and, and volunteer and raise your hands if you have questions. I, I did want, I know, uh, Harold, you, you've looked at uh, some of the competitive concerns about this as well. I know you wanted to make an extra comment. Yes, I, I wanted to point out one of the things we trace in this paper is the fact that um, the what we now call the CPNI provision started out um, as a pro-competitive measure. Uh, and that as part of the evolution of what is now Section 222, um, the, uh, um, the House, particularly uh, then Representative Markey, uh, was very instrumental in making sure that this was an extremely strong consumer protection statute. The result was that a number of the pieces that had initially been included as part of the uh, um, the competition protection were transplanted into other sections and primarily dealt with um, the uh, major telephone companies who at that time were the uh, uh, the big uh, providers. But um, one of the most important provisions that was put in as a backup, which is often overlooked, is Section 222B, which expressly says that uh, the uh, if you're a telecommunications provider uh, and somebody is interconnecting with you, another telecommunications provider is interconnecting with you in order to uh, provide service, uh, you're not allowed to use anything that is revealed by the, uh, um, by the uh, competitor for your own marketing purposes or for your own uh, um, information. Let me give one example of where that's really important um, as we move into the broadband universe. So T-Mobile has a thing called binge on. And Verizon and AT&T also have competing wireless services. So they might be curious, for example, is binge on really something that is attracting a lot of customers? Um, and how could we measure that? Not, you know, not just, yeah, we're losing customers because 
you know, T-Mobile's been growing for a while, how can you tell if it's really, you know, binge on or the fact that they now have better coverage? Well, T-Mobile buys interconnection from people um, like AT&T and Verizon through things called special access, they contract for backhaul, that's an, an interconnection point. So these guys can look and see, okay, is there a spike in video traffic that is now flowing through the connection to T-Mobile? Um, do I, um, you know, I can get pretty granular because of all of this other, other information that has to be revealed about when, how, which customers it's associated with. So already my competitor's product is now my market research, which if you're the incumbent is totally awesome, and if you're the competitor, totally sucks. So, but it gets better because let's pretend that I'm a Verizon Fios customer and a T-Mobile subscriber, I'm not either, but let's pretend for a minute I was. Um, Verizon Fios will notice how much I'm transferring my viewing habit from my laptop or even my hand to headset um, going through the Wi-Fi connection and transferring that to viewing on my handset over the T-Mobile connection. So it can also determine which of the, in both of these, through these connections, can also determine which of the binge on services are the most vital to have in any kind of competing service. So there is a whole host of information that right now would be directly prohibited under um, 222B that the Federal Trade Commission never touches because that's not uh, uh, the purpose of the Federal uh, Trade Commission to promote this kind of competition, but which I think we would all agree if we want a healthy competitive wireless market, we need to protect in order to make sure that my innovative uh, competitive offering does not become my competitor's market research. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask the panel a question uh, back to the, the concern for consumers. You know, Sarah made the point about how you know broadband has become an essential basic service, and so given that uh, you know the existing phone CPI rules allow for customers to opt out, is, is it fair for a consumer, given that this is a basic basic essential service, to give up their privacy voluntarily? It's often an argument that you hear when it comes to internet privacy that people are more and more willing to give up their privacy in in, in exchange for online services. I mean, I, <clears throat> I think there's a, a couple of different ways to, I, buried in that question, I think, is the, the question of paid, paid for, pay for privacy arrangements and things like that. Um, and I think that, you know, pri baseline privacy protections shouldn't be a luxury. And so uh, the implementation of, uh, of strong, clear privacy rules under the CPNI framework, I think, is, is really important. Um, you know, I, that's not to say that consumers shouldn't have choice in how they, how they, how their data can be used, but uh, the, the baseline privacy protections for us are, are very important. I'll just add to that to, to, to say that I, in, in CTS view, this is a very difficult question because on, on some level, you know, giving consumers choice means giving them consumer choice in, in, in what they do with their personal information. And I, I think in, in some arrangements uh, where, where this has come up, really the concern hasn't been over, over the, the, the mere fact of, um, of, of, of consumers being able to enter into this arrangement, but the actual terms of, the, of that arrangement in, in, in cases where the, the, the cost of, of opting out of a, of a, of a sort of a personal information sharing arrangement is, is so prohibitively high that it actually seems something more coercive rather than being something like the like participating in, in a competitive market for the sale of your, of your information. So this is this is definitely a, a, a question that, that we will have to, 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 to grapple with and at some point the, the FCC may need to, may need to gra grapple with, but I, but I think at the end of the day this is probably not a, a yes or no question. Let me add a couple of uh, considerations that are very important here. One is the competition aspect. Um, my general opt-in or worse opt-out should not be allowed to reveal the competing information from 
businesses like the alarm industry um, because there's a whole set of information that I, the consumer, are probably not even aware of that is directly related uh, to these competition questions. So using the FCC's competition enhancement, which is not just 222B, but there are also statutes that apply to wireless and cable, which are important here, there are competitive concerns about this kind of waiver. Um, the uh, other uh, point which is exceedingly important here is in two-way communication, um, we've never let you expose the content on a waiver. I could always opt out or of the telephone company using my CPNI to sell me services um, in the telephone universe. I could never consent to the telephone company listening in on my conversations because that conversation is a two-way conversation. As we move to the yeah, realm of uh, the yeah, internet and the availability of certain practices, the question is, so can I opt into DPI for these purposes? Well, do, do, I'm sorry, DPI uh, being deep packet inspection, um, it allows the cable operator, or excuse me, the broadband provider to actually look inside the content uh, of what I'm sending, rather than simply look at that header information that uh, uh, Eric was talking about earlier on the outside. There are, right now, providers that ask if you'd like them to use DPI in order to provide you with better services. And we'll combine this DPI um, information, that is the actual content, with all other information they uh, collect for their advertising companies or other things. Now that's with user consent. You know, the user is saying, sure, I love that. You know, I want people, I want you to not bore me with bad advertising. I want you to advertise services that are relevant to me. But they're also choosing to expose not just their information, but my information. When I, Harold Feld, am communicating with somebody who has opted into this, I don't know that you've opted into the please spy on me box. And if I'm not happy with your receiving um, provider looking at the content of my email or other communication to you, I have no way of knowing that you are, you know, permitting that. So with regards to, this is not an on-off. The nature of the information, the type of information that consumers can opt in or opt out to revealing needs to be studied very carefully because in an interactive network like this, you may be signing away the rights to stuff that you don't have a right to sign away to. Okay. And don't be shy, folks. Please raise your hand, otherwise I'll just keep asking questions. Um, so, oh great, hands right away. Let's start here and we'll work our way around. Sure. Angie Cronenberg from Encompass. I was wondering if maybe you could expound upon the current obligations that apply the FCC to some of these providers, like Harold you talked about special access. Well, special access has been a Title II service, has never been in doubt that it's a Title II service. So presumably 222 has applied all along to special access. Um, and is there any kind of correlation of those rules in the context of that service that should apply here? And then it also would just be kind of nice to hear, like, well, what's different? What is different that you're proposing now versus where broadband internet access service providers have been in the context of when it was defined as an information service. I mean, I, I won't take the, the, the special access question. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll kick that one right back to Harold. Um, but, but, but I think, I think what, what, what's different about uh, what, what's happening now as opposed to what happened in, in, the, in the context when when broadband providers are, are uh, were on were just information services is, is simply this question of, of having rulemaking authority. I mean, the, the, I mean the, the 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 one sort of at times it seems, it seems has seemed slightly schizophrenic uh, as to whether um, different participants in, in the internet ecosystem <laughs> would prefer rules or just sort of vague sort of standards like under Section Five that 
that are sort of enforced only on a case by case basis, if at all. Um, I, I think in, in the Wyndham case, you, you saw a call for, for clear privacy rules, whereas now that the, the FCC actually has this rulemaking authority, um, you're seeing people uh, who are the potential uh, regulatory subjects of these rules um, calling for something more just like principles and, and standards. And, and, uh, and, and so I think the, the, the one thing that the FCC is really good at that it was not able to do before now is to actually uh, provide rules that provide clarity to all participants in the internet ecosystem over the, uh, the, 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 the legitimate privacy uh, expectations of, of users of broadband networks and how those uh, expectations will be enforced. All right, well, specifically on the special access question, we've got a very complicated situation. One of the issues is that, as we all know, Ethernet loops, which are increasingly the most uh, uh, important means by which uh, carriers purchase uh, uh, these backhaul services and special access, were the FCC forbore from everything but 201, 202. So they explicitly forbore with regard to the sale of Ethernet loops um, from Section 222. That's a problem. Um, the other issue that you get is when you are doing these negotiations uh, around terms and service, around interconnection, um, I anticipate that we see, we'll see going forward lots of legal arguments around the nature of the traffic, what's carried, what's not carried. If there's a yeah, provision governing broadband, even as a Title II service, is somehow different and the standard CPNI regulations don't apply there, then in the absence of clarification from the FCC um, with regard to 222B, what happens? Um, I understand that incumbents have very good lawyers um, and that uh, um, many of them are prepared to make arguments about how we slice and dice and divvy up the traffic and you know reclassify it. It additionally raises concerns with regard to not covered entities such as cable operators who are increasingly moving into the contractual uh, um, you know the, the backhaul business. Now I'm all for that. Yay competition. Um, but without baseline rules in place um, the uh, question becomes for carriers, particularly smaller carriers or competitive carriers. Um, so if there's now not one ILEC monopoly possibility, but two, count them two possible backhaul providers, or maybe three possible backhaul providers, how do I protect myself where I have very little uh, negotiating power um, and the other parties have negotiating power? Uh, and where um, if my choice is between a lower price than I might get from another provider, but you get to look at all of my competing information, including that of my customers, do I know both as a customer and as a yeah, competitor that you won't take uh, that bargain? Additionally, you have the problem, as I mentioned earlier, of you get to combine all of these sorts of information very different ways. Um, and things that you don't discover, for example, through the direct interconnection process, you can use information that's at the basis of the interconnection process that you know to cross-correlate and check with other things, um, use it with information you already have from the broadband subscription or from the cable subscription. Um, one of the biggest things that we recommend is that the FCC has to take a look at this comprehensively. It has to invoke not just its 222 authority, not just its 201B authority, which is part of the uh, um, Title II, uh, but it also needs to invoke its Section 628 authority, which is the cable competition uh, statute, so that we can protect OTT video competition, um, many of which are not OTTs, so we also think they need to invoke Section 637, which is the general cable privacy statute. Um, they need to invoke uh, your Title III authority with regard to wireless services, which may not uh, uh, be explicitly covered, for the express purpose of protecting consumers and competitors alike from two things. One, the shell game, where, oh no, I didn't collect that through 222B, I collected that over my cable system, and then cross-correlated with aggregate information that I'm allowed to pull under 222B. So now even though I have exactly the same granular uh, picture, my shell game on between the services lets me evade specific rules targeted uh, uh, over one type of service. 
but also in recognition of the fact that this is now enormously powerful. The amount of information that your residential broadband provider, particularly if it is also your MVPD uh, uh, provider, if you rent the set-top box from them, if you get your Wi-Fi access hot you know, from them, all of that information can be combined in ways that were not previously possible that require the FCC to use all of the tools uh, at its disposal to uh, protect privacy. Let's go right next to you. Hi, Lynn Stanton from TR Daily. Um, I'm interested in this concept of consumers not having the right to give away information that you're saying belongs to somebody else. It seems like it's a lot like saying that if I want to go get a different service from the service I have now, I can't tell them what I'm paying for my current service, I can't tell them exactly what I get from my provider with my current service. No, not at all. That, that, that's my point. This is multi-layered. One of the key elements of both Section 222 and Section 637 of the Cable Privacy is to put the customer in charge. The customer is king. You know, there's specific provisions of these statutes that allow a customer to direct a, yeah, um, the carrier or the cable operator to provide me with this uh, information. So, um, you know, the idea is that I, the customer, am the boss. The question is, a particular category of information that has nothing to do with what I'm paying, that has nothing to do with what services I'm receiving, that has nothing to do with any of the things that are clearly mine that belong to somebody else, that they are implicated in interested parties. And that requires a certain amount of balancing. That balancing is built into Section 222 through 222B um, and needs to be evaluated here in this broader context. You know, I can either I have to hang some kind of sign outside my door that says, hey, Sarah, I know you're a privacy freak, so the fact that I'm letting RCN, my actual broadband provider, monitor everything that comes over my wire, you might not want to talk to me uh, now. Or we say, I can't give RCN permission to monitor Sarah's conversation. The fact that it's a conversation with me doesn't change the fact that it's still also a conversation with Sarah. And that's an issue. The sort of more interesting gray area is, you know, the question of the alarm company, and there I think there are very legitimate uh, um, questions that we ought to ask, which is, yeah, maybe I as the customer can tell Comcast or RCN or anybody what services I'm getting. But so they know I've got a competing alarm company so that they can, you know, tell me about the wonderfulness of their alarm system. But there are, A, it has to be really clear that's what you're doing. It can't just be, we might take some of your information and might use it in some interesting ways, which is what you have now on these disclosures. Um, it really ought to be, if it's somebody else's proprietary information, okay, you understand you're letting us look directly at the competitor. Um, it ought to be something the competitor should insulate uh, from, saying, you, the customer, cannot decide to give away this information to your broadband provider, we should at least consider, because otherwise I don't want to service you because you're providing my direct competitor market information. These are all things that we need to look at uh, and figure out where the proper balance is. But I'm very comfortable, based on you know our long history of not letting telephone companies listen into the actual conversations uh, of uh, people on the telephone, that we really should not allow broadband providers to do the equivalent of, through deep packet inspection, to look at the actual content of two-way communications. Uh, we're going to go here in the front row, and then we'll come to the back. Thank you. Uh, Paul Marion from CQ Roll Call. I, I, I guess I have sort of a real basic question. is if the, if the goal is greater protection of data privacy for the FCC, how do they actually do that, given how the Internet works? I mean, is it, you're talking about a hardware black box solution or, or just not letting them use that information that they inevitably are going to see? How does, it, how does, the, how does the FCC actually achieve this goal? Yeah, I, I think this is, is not a technological um, 
question. I mean, I mean, I mean, again, as I said earlier, like CPNI is information that that the uh, that that the network uh, provider needs access to. I mean, with, without it, they can't make sure the packets get to and from where they're supposed to be going. Uh, the the question is around use and, and and the way that the FCC would 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 go about making sure that that I uh, on. Um, that the uses of, of, of CPNI can, are, are consistent with, with any promulgated rules is, is through the, the, the process that it uses to make sure all of its rules are, are, are adhered to, which is a, a series of, of formal and informal complaints, um, and, and enfor enforcement guidances, and occasional uh, petitions for, for, for rulemaking, or, or the, where those rules can be, can be clarified. So I, I don't think that any of us are, are, are up here asking for a, a technological mandate or, 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 or a technological solution to this problem, and I, and I think that that, that 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 wouldn't really benefit the overall you know, continued evolution of the uh, of the internet ecosystem. The FCC's 20-year-old traditional CPNI rules have been enormously successful. They raise similar problems. I will offer as proof of the fact that they are enormously successful that when Pew um, Research surveyed consumers and asked them what means of electronic communication do you consider the most uh, secure, the overwhelming winner was traditional landline telephone, which are where the, uh, um, the traditional CPNI rules. Next after that was cellular. And I don't know for sure, but I would guess part of the reason why cellular was below, um, uh, was below uh, um, wireline was because of the nature of radio communication allows people to uh, uh, to intercept the signal because CPNI rules apply to both of those. Everything else was a huge drop down in terms of how secure people felt their information was. Email, um, you know, uh, direct uh, chat uh, clients, um, all of these things were you know, did not even, they, they were basically at sort of Chris Christie levels of, uh, um, of general support and approval on privacy. Um, so, uh, the, uh, um, there, it is clear that even without knowing gen specifically about the CPNI rules, that consumers have a very high degree of confidence in privacy to those services for which these rules are applied. The problems that you're asking about, how do I actually know, how do I make sure that the company doesn't do it anyway, um, the FCC has developed mechanisms for this, including they have to report on their CPNI collection and use under a certification to the FCC annually. Um, they uh, um, have a high standard to which they're held uh, accountable. Um, the FCC uh, imposes a reporting obligation in the event of data breach or in the event of uh, uh, of a uh, violation as soon as the company becomes aware of it. There was an enforcement case, I think it's now two years ago, um, where Verizon got fined because they waited until after they'd solved the data breach problem to report it. Not because they didn't actually uh, um, ultimately report it, but because they didn't re comply with the rules that required reporting in a timely way. Uh, uh, manner, because the FCC is really vigorous about this. Um, so I think that you're right. Um, it certainly presents challenges, but the advantage of having the FCC do it is they're not new challenges. You know, we're just talking about solving, uh, you know, it's a more complex environment to be sure, but um, we've had basic solutions that have been time-tested and worked, and there's no reason why the FCC uh, uh, can't build off those for uh, the uh, next generation of privacy protections. On the aisle in the back. Thanks. Jules Polonetsky at the Future Privacy Forum. Um, I've been working on ed tech issues almost as long as Harold has been working on FCC <coughs> issues. And so the section of the report that talks about the data that's available externally, certainly ISPs and so forth have a, access to a wide range of data, but I hesitate to minimize um, the vast amount of data that is automatically distributed to hundreds of parties as soon as I get online. And I think the choices, this is a real challenge for those of us who want to see real choices sort of in Antec. Um, clearing cookies is sort of malpractice nowadays. You, you, we tell people clear cookies, you know, there's browser fingerprinting, there's cross-device tracking, there's just such a broad range of areas where 
the options and choices are broken, Senator Markey's been pushing for do not track because we don't have a way to don't track. So I, I guess I just would ask whether you guys would be interested in sort of going deeper into, you know, uh, the kind of data that is available. I, I somehow am on Oracle's mailing list, and so I keep getting uh, offers to license their data as a service. I don't even need to buy it anymore. With a credit card, I can license it. So just wonder whether you'd all be open to sort of, and it's only one of the arguments, I, I get that, but sort of, you know, looking at the holistic picture of, um, uh, how do we solve the big problem in one, you know, swoop? This is just FCC, but this is framing up a really important issue. Do people have the choice when they turn on their computer or fire up their cell phone? So, and is there some way to leverage these things to solve the big problem? And Jules brings up, uh, you know, I think not in the negative, but I mean, some of the criticism that folks have heard around the FCC moving forward also is that the FCC is picking winners and losers, and somehow they should be going after broader privacy or, or you know, so, uh, Eric, it sounded like you wanted to address this, or? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll go first and then let uh, Harold follow, follow up, but, but I, I think this is, this is a, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, or Sarah follow up, um, or Mary follow up. Um, this is definitely a, a valid concern, and, and, and you see one, uh, it has been a voice frustration in, in, this, in, in this proceeding that, 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 that somehow people will be left with the impression that addressing privacy practices for, um, for broadband internet access service providers will in itself um, be a comprehensive act, act, uh, answer to, to, um, to, to privacy protection on the, on the internet. I, I don't think that there's anyone on this panel who actually believes that. I think there, there, there's an acknowledgement that, that a, a comprehensive uh, solution is needed and, and, and CDT has, has, has long called for, for comprehensive privacy legislation. I, I think what's interesting in, in, in this context and what's important to, to remember is that, is that the, the Federal Communications Commission is an agency with, with very defined uh, jurisdiction or, or a very discrete uh, set of actors within that ecosystem. In that case, that that is broadband internet access service providers, and, and and we I think we definitely hope that we move towards sort of some symmetrical um, or more symmetrical privacy protections that still acknowledges that that the roles that the edge providers have and the role that internet access providers have are are, are distinct, but they, they, they ultimately that the, the consumer is using both of them when they use the internet. Can I jump in quickly? Yeah, please. <clears throat> I would just say too that the statute was was framed in recognition that gatekeepers can exist and and recognizing the specific relationship between internet service providers and their customers. And so, as as Eric mentioned, you know this is a, a, a specific intended, a uh, targeted uh, statute to address a, a certain the use of information in certain contexts. Um, and so I, I agree with Eric that, that you, you, using the FCC's use of that section um, in the broadband context um, shouldn't foreclose uh, asking the big, broader questions about privacy um, in general. Mary, I mean, you know, as you know, a, a, a service online, that uh, you guys, I'm assuming, don't expect to be under FCC privacy rules, but you do have some sort of privacy uh, guidelines or, or rules, can you explain how it works as a non-broadband uh, provider? Uh, yes, um, oh. yeah, we're the members of the alarm industry are not communications providers and are not subject to the FCC's jurisdiction as such. Um, however, uh, as business businesses, they are interested in making sure their customers' data is protected, obviously, as since part of their business is security, it's extremely important that they protect their customers' data and information. Um, uh, that's part of part of their business, and so uh, it, not only is it necessary as part of their business, but it's necessary just as good business practice. So they are all uh, trying to keep abreast of all the latest and greatest ways of making sure they have processes in place. Um, uh, anything they can do from a technology standpoint to make sure that um, customer information can be protected. Um, they're trying to keep abreast of all those things and implement them as appropriate. And uh, so yeah, that's a very important part of it. it. Just the one comment that I would make though, and this does touch on the alarm industry a little bit, 
Um, customer privacy is only as good as what the customer understands. And I think a lot of what has been touched on here is, um, I think most people don't really understand how their data and information is being used. And um, even, even when uh, some company tells you, oh, you have the, uh, you, you know, check this box to allow me to do X, Y, Z. Who really understands that? There's no real explanation. And there's also usually no explanation that they actually have a right to say no. In fact, most of these disclosures are usually written in the form of, if you check the box, you should understand that you may not get any service at all from me. So it's more like a threat to check, you know, check the box and give away whatever privacy or whatever information you may have. So, I, um, and the way that touches on the alarm industry is there's always the concern as a competitor, so you want to make sure, um, and this, you want to make sure that your competitors are not falsely providing information to your customers about what they must do or must not do. And, uh, and that ties in with the whole issue that the alarm industry has. Um, and you know the CPNI aspect of it is not the actual communication, but it is the information like routing information and things like that that are necessary for the communication to go through. So it is something uniquely given to communications providers, um, and from that information they can determine all sorts of information, all sorts of things about your customers, and, and there should be some. Um, some protections for competitors, otherwise you lose a competitive market. Okay. The key word, Jules, is really in that last sentence that you had. Leverage. There is absolutely, it is the system design that we talk about in this white paper that permits us to leverage what the FCC is doing here to further beef up privacy protections in other areas. Everything that the FCC does here, it's public record, it's rulemaking, you know, everything that it is doing will provide further information to the Federal Trade Commission, to uh, the you know, members of Congress, with regard to this other side of the equation. How do we beef up and expand the overall uh, um, you know, problem of protecting consumer privacy in this age where, you know, your lamp can be collecting personal information about you and beaming it back to some unknown mothership. The, uh, um, you know, the, uh, the, the one thing I also just want to stress is the other exciting word from our political campaigns these days, pragmatic approach, which is the way you solve a problem this big and this complex is to break it down into the solvable pieces and keep solving them, rather than standing back and trying to figure out, you know, how am I going to, uh, um, you know, create one large general solution that's going to encompass all kinds of different technologies and special cases. You're never going to solve it that way. The only way you're going to solve it is if you say, I got this piece. I'm going to do what I can on this piece. How I solve the problem here informs how I'm going to solve the problem over here. And we keep moving until we actually get to a place where we're no longer, as consumers, sitting with you know, the equivalent of naked in a glass house with regard to our uh, personal information. Chris, could I? Uh, so we, we are over our time. Um, how about we do one more question and then we'll cut it off there since, yeah. All right, if you don't mind. I, I think Mary hit on something. If, if the end result is that the privacy policies that you have to check off before you download the software or get on Twitter just become more complex, what good is it going to do? Uh, I mean, don't you have to change that equation, uh, make it a real choice? And can the FCC do that? Which I, I probably is the first question. Can the FCC do that? I mean, you're, you want to take, because I think your paper demonstrates that they can. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I would say that, that yes, that they can, and, and, and that yes, that they should. I mean, I mean, I mean, one one thing about about uh, the, the, the current uh, 
rules require is is that no, notice be given to the to, to the consumer, and, and these these are the rules that that, that apply to um, the, uh, the the PSDM rather than to heavy networks. Um, but that that notice be given to to, to consumers, and, and and the SC has the has has the authority to make sure that that notice is effective, and part of doing so, make sure that that notice is given in in, in terms that, that users can understand. I mean, I mean, the, while there there are there is arcane terminology um, associated with with IP networks, one thing that I <laughs> I hope that we did uh, in in uh, in our, our our sort of short paper, sort of exploring these, is is break it down into the the, the very um, uh, practical implications of the information that's collected, and I think this is something that the FCC is 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 uniquely positioned to work with. Um, with, with consumer groups and, and with uh, with ISPs to make sure that the information about about uh, you know what what CPNI is collected and, and, and what is done with it is communicated in, into uh, uh, in, in terms that users can understand such that when they give their assent to, to, to use of that information that that, that 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 consent is effective. And with regard to your Twitter question, again it goes to this. Setting aside the fact that my broadband provider sees a hell of a lot more information than Twitter. So it's not like, oh, it's useless unless I get everybody, because Twitter is not talking to my damn smart stove. You know? Whereas, you know, my Nest is not tweeting, but it is communicating over broadband, and my broadband provider is getting all kinds of information, and that informational environment is getting more rich, such as, do I have a Nest? Um, the uh, um, the other important factor is you start with the broadband providers where you have a specialized agency that has the power to do rulemakings, that has the power to explore these proceedings, um, the, you know, these practices and proceedings in public, and you set a standard for the kind of disclosures that we're talking about, for the kind of opt-in rather than opt-out protections, doing all of these judgments, issuing rules that say this, this, and this, and here's why. That makes it a hell of a lot easier for the FTC to say, yeah, you know what? Looking to uh, uh, how we do things through enforcement against companies like you know, Twitter, Facebook, Google, whatever, we can say, yeah, the FCC has now done a lot of work on this, and they've shown the kind of harm that happens when you have access to this information. We can now meet the standard that we have to meet under Section 5 sub N in order to show it is substantial injury, in order to show that you can't really avoid, the consumer can't really avoid it without opt out rather than opt in, to show that uh, there are not prevailing benefits to competition if you allow uh, this kind of collection uh, uh, of information. So what the FCC does today helps the FTC to do its job tomorrow. And it helps Congress, should it decide that it wants to address this issue and come up with more comprehensive solutions, to have a basis for which it can determine where are the real issues, what is the nature of the harm, and what do we have to do in order to balance these things uh, in order to protect privacy while still giving consumers choice. All right. We're going to have to stop it there. We are well past 11 o'clock, but I want to thank everyone for coming out. This is... Uh, an important topic uh, that we hope people will continue to uh, uh, talk about, uh, talk with our organizations uh, up here about. And uh, want you to thank me, uh, help me in thanking our panelists for uh, for talking for the last hour. Thank you. And again, the uh, the studies should be available outside on the table in the back. Thanks, everybody.